excited to share the word with you. Let me pray for you. Father, I just thank you for this day. Lord, I don't, I don't know why you choose to put your glory, your treasure in these jars of clay. But here we are. Lord, I thank you for just the opportunity to walk with you and to know you. But I also thank you, God, that Christianity is a contact sport. And so, Lord, help us to understand that, affirm that in our hearts in this service today, in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 So between 250 and 270 A.D., uh, there was a terrible plague believed to be measles or, or smallpox that devastated the Roman Empire. Um, at the height of what uh, came to be known as the Plague of Cyprian, uh, 5,000 people died in Rome every day. Uh, the plague coincided with the first empire-wide persecution of Christians under the emperor Decius. And not surprisingly, Decius and the enemies of Christianity began blaming Christians for the plague. But there were two inconvenient facts that they couldn't get over as they tried to blame the Christians. The first one was that Christians were dying in this plague just as much as anyone else. But the second one was that uh, the Christians, unlike everyone else, cared for the victims of the plague, including their pagan neighbors. Now, this wasn't new. Christians had done the same thing during the Antonine Plague just a century earlier. Uh, in both plagues, Christians stayed in the afflicted cities when pagan leaders, even physicians, fled. So Candida Moss, a, a professor of New Testament and early Christianity at Notre Dame, uh, she notes that an epidemic that seemed like the end of the world actually contributed and promoted the spread of Christianity. Then she goes on, she says something so fascinating. She says, by their actions in the face of possible death, Christians showed their neighbors that Christianity is worth dying for. Think about that with me. They show that Christianity was worth dying for. And so that's what I'm challenged with today. I don't know about you, but, but, but I'm challenged by this, this idea that, you know, it, is that what people see when they encounter me? Like, do they see someone who is dead serious? It's dead serious. It's dead serious, right? <laughs> they see someone who's dead serious about their faith, right? Like, do they see someone who puts them before him at all costs? That's what I want to be. That's what I want to be. We're in a series that we've been calling words, and we've been looking at words that we assume we know, right? Words that you hear in church and among Christians all the time. And some of these words uh, we in the church have uh, become numb to. Some of them lack clarity. And I would say to you that today we're going to look at a word that fits both, all right? Uh, we've become numb to this word, and we've also downgraded it to an issue of personal preference. All right? uh, but what I want to show you today is that our correct understanding and handling of this word is, is the sign of any real, true gospel faith. Right? That's the case I want to make today. So today, we're going to talk about the word neighbor. Everyone say neighbor. 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 Now, let's think about this word for a moment. All right? How do we relate to our neighbors today? Your next door neighbor may be close to you in proximity, but how close are they to you personally? There is a, a company called Safe Home uh, who did a, a survey uh, of a, a large group of Americans, and they asked them whether they ever completed 10 neighborly actions. And based on their answers to these questions, they were able to get a read on how we fare as Americans on neighborly kindness. So I want to I try this survey on you. Is that, is that okay? Can we try this survey together? All right, so here's how this is going to go. I'm going to ask 10 questions, and what you're going to do is you're going to put your, everyone just put your hand up, just raise your hand, all right? So as I ask these questions, if they apply to you, keep your hand up. If they don't, put your hand down, okay? All right, so let's see how, how close we, we are to how uh, the, the people who were surveyed handled this. So your hands, I know, it's tiring, I get it, but you're right, you're right. I see so many, all right, it's okay, you'll be all right. All right, so let's try this. All right, number one, how many of you, by keeping your hands up, keep your hand up if you've ever smiled at your neighbors? If you've smiled at your neighbors, keep your hand up. Okay? 
So 94% of those surveyed. Simon, we already lost some people in the survey. All right. Uh, how many of you have spoken to your neighbors at least once? Keep your hand up. Have you spoken to your neighbors at least once? Okay, we're doing good. We're okay. Uh, how many of you have learned your neighbors' names? You've learned your neighbors. Like if I put the mic in your face right now, you could tell me the names of your neighbors. Keep your hand up. Okay, still doing okay. How many of you, by keeping your hand up, you introduced yourself to your neighbors when you first moved in? Okay, you, you introduced yourself to your neighbors. Okay, still doing okay. All right, how many of you would say, by keeping your hand up, that you speak to your neighbors frequently? You speak to your neighbors frequently. Okay, uh, you're kind of thinking about it. Okay. How many of you have, okay, here it goes. How many of you have been in your neighbor's homes? You've been in your neighbor's homes. Oh, sucky, sucky. Now we're losing some people. Okay, dropping off, we're dropping off. Okay, how many of you, by keeping your hands up, you've had your neighbors in your home? Keep your hand up. If you've had your neighbors in your home, oh, we've lost a lot of you. How many of you have gotten your neighbor's mail while they were out of town? I would even extend, I would extend, no, 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 stop it, stop it. Hey, if you lose, it's all right. Hey, pastors lose sometimes too, it's all right, buddy. Okay, I'll, I'll extend this to if you've like moved their garbage up and down. Okay, you can keep your hand up. Stop, stop, stop. Complainers in the front row. Keep your hand up if you've hung out with your neighbor outside of the neighborhood. You've hung out with your neighbors outside of your neighborhood. Wow, wow. 16%. 16%. All right, lastly, how many of you have house sat for your neighbors before? You've house sat for your neighbors. About 11% of those surveyed. All right, so I think we kind of keep pretty true to form. So thank you guys for helping me with that. All right, so what do we learn? What do we learn? I think what we learn, yeah, if you, if you put your hand up, I may never let it come down in service. All right, but what we learn, we are really good at low-cost kindness. That's what we're good at. Like, like, we know how to smile at each other. We know how to exchange pleasantries. Like, we know how to introduce ourselves, but anything that starts to require, like, legitimate, authentic relationship, many of us opt out. We opt out. I think another way to measure our interaction with our neighbors is through entertainment. Uh, TV shows do a, a great job historically of kind of taking a snapshot of cultural um, uh, norms. And so if you study TV neighbors, I just sat down and thought about this. All right, so this is not based on research. I just sat down and thought this through. But if you, if you think about TV neighbors as they were presented to us historically, I think you get a read on how we interact with each other and how we relate to each other. So let, let me take you through this. All right, in the 1950s and 60s, we were presented with some specific neighbors that I want to call out. So 1951, TV introduced us to Fred and Ethel Mertz. Okay? All right. I love Lucy. Okay, when you hear the show, just say it out loud. I love Lucy. Lucy, Ricky Ricardo's landlords and next door neighbors, right? In 1960, we were introduced to Barney and Betty Rubble. Okay? Flintstones, okay? Barney and Fred were homies. <laughs> homies, all right? In 1968, we were introduced to Mr. Rogers, all right? Like, this is, a, this is a neighbor of all neighbors. Like, everyone wants to live next to Mr. Rogers, right? But then as you move into the, the mid-1980s, you see a trend in neighbors that are presented to us. Uh, th these, are, these are arguably, in my opinion, these are the best neighbors of all time, all right? But I want you to notice how similar these people are in character and personality, all right, in the 1980s. 1987, TV introduced to us Kimmy Gibbler, okay? 1989, TV introduced to us Ned Flanders. 1989, TV introduced to us Kramer. 1989, TV introduced to us Steve Urkel. Are you following me? We move into the 90s. And as we get in there, we get 
uh, neighbors like in 1991. We got Wilson Wilson Jr., right? That, that re- home improvement, that weird neighbor who you can only see part of his face. 1992, you get Bruh Man from the fifth floor. Now, now that one was for my culture folks in the audience. Martin, Martin. All right, so listen, if you, if you didn't know Bruh Man from the fifth floor in the 90s, you really missed something. You need to go back and relive that. But 1992, you get Bruh Man from Martin. Uh, 1994, you get the ugly, ugly naked guy, all right, right, from Friends, all right? And so really since the early 2000s and even to current, um, there's nothing really unique about neighbors on TV that endear them to us anymore. But I want you guys to, to look at this trend, all right? Can you see this? Look at this trend with me. Our neighbors went from being integrated into our families in the 50s and the 60s and into the 1980s, they became these irritating interruptions that we just had to put up with. And into the 90s, they became this, these mysterious, unknown people that you could never figure out. See how we've changed over time? This is who we are. Culturally speaking, you know, we, we just kind of we keep our circles small. We don't play around. Our general approach to relationship with our neighbors is to keep them at arm's length. And where this gets dangerous is that this is not just an issue in our neighborhoods, guys. This cultural phenomenon is pervasive in the church. See, many of us want a private moralism where we don't, uh, we, we don't, we want to worship God individually with no requirement or obligation to get involved with others. That's what we want. So I want to show you three things today. I want to show you the Savior's stance on neighborliness. I want to show you the spiritual significance for neighborliness, and I want to show you the source of strength to do it well. Would that be all right with you? Yeah. All right, the, the savior stance of neighborliness. I want to show you just how serious God is about our engagement with our neighbors. The spiritual significance of neighborliness, what's in it for you, is the one I want to show you, and then the source of strength to do it well. Uh, neighborliness is not instinctive. It's not. We all have a bent towards self. But when we truly understand the ways in which Jesus showed neighborly love towards us, it empowers us to run towards the plague like the early Christians did in Rome. Amen? Amen? All right. So the Savior stance. We'll start there. The text in Scripture that I believe most informs our relationship uh, with each other and with our neighbors is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in Luke 10, 25, a lawyer, an, an expert in biblical law, stood up and he asked Jesus a question. He wanted to test him. The Bible says. And so he asked Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, being the great teacher that he was, turns the question around by asking the man a question. Uh, And I I think here that Jesus knows that he's not looking for a literal answer. So he turns around on me. He asks, what's written in the law? How does it read to you? And the law expert, to no one's surprise, gets it right. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus affirms him in his answer, and that should have been the end, but this was a lot, about a lot more than biblical knowledge. Uh, he wanted to justify himself, Scripture says. Some scholars have said this man was trying to rationalize his own racial prejudice. I, mean, I want you to think about this with me for a second. This man had the answer key memorized, yet was still failing. I want to suggest to you that we can be a lot like this man, that sometimes, guys, we can have all the answers and still be wrong. Like, like, I, like I know you've been a Christian for a long time, and, and I know that you've memorized Scripture, and I know your church attendance is on point, but if your walk with God does not produce humility in you, it will most certainly produce defensiveness and self-justification. It will. So the man asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And as Martin Luther King so beautifully puts it, Jesus snatches this question out of midair and places it on a dangerous curb between Jerusalem and Jericho. This man wanted to know the limits of his responsibility to others. Is, is, is neighbor a geographical term? Is it an ethnic term? Is it a tribal term? Like, what exactly are the limits here? It doesn't apply to everyone, does it? 
if you look throughout scripture, you see God emphasizing the importance of love and care for others. It, it's all throughout scripture. And he does it through creation. Everyone say creation. creation. And association. Say association. association. He does it through creation and an association. Uh, and in creation, each of us were made in the image of God, which gives us a right, uh, which gives us a worth, a glory, a significance that must be honored. Early in the book of Genesis, you see uh, God condemns murder and cites the sacredness of our being made in the image of God as the reason why. And then as you continue to go through scripture, you get into the book of James and you see that cursing each other is condemned because we're made in God's likeness. That, that there's, there's something so valuable about human beings that we may not only not be murdered, but we can't even curse each other without receiving our just due because of the worth bestowed upon us by God. The image of God carries with it the right to not even be mistreated or harmed. C.S. Lewis, in his famous sermon, Weight of Glory, he makes this point better than I can. He says, next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. Martin Luther King Jr. talked a lot about the image of God. Uh, arguably, uh, the image of God was at the very heart of the civil rights movement. And in his sermon, The American Dream, listen to what Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said, you see, the founding fathers were really influenced by the Bible. Uh, the whole concept of the Imago Dei, as it's expressed in Latin, the image of God, is this idea that all men have something in them that God injected. We must never forget this as a nation. There are no degradations in the image of God. Every man from a treble white to a base black is significant on God's keyboard precisely because every man is made in the image of God. And so you see uh, that through creation, God emphasizes neighbor, but God also does this through association. Like it is crazy uh, how often we see God introduced in scripture as a defender of vulnerable groups. Now I want you to think about this. Historically, like world history, the way that deities would infuse themselves into a civilization and into, into cultures is they would always they would always click up with the rich and the elite. They would always do it that way. Why? Because the rich and the elite actually have the influence to, to, to spread right, their belief system and their rituals. The, the rich and elite had the ability to build them their temples. But if you read the Bible, God doesn't do that. You read, you read scripture and you hear God say things like, I'm a defender of the widow. I love the poor. I'm the father of the fatherless. I mean, completely different. I mean, look at this. Uh, Deuteronomy 10, 18. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows love for the foreigner by giving him food and clothing. Psalm 146, 9. The Lord watches over the foreigner, sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. See, neighborliness was uh, a problem in Judaism because they were the chosen people. They were, they were the circumcised. And this made them particularly loyal to their own kind, even to the point of neglect uh, and condemnation to those who weren't Israelites. And so as you see God continue to put laws, mosaic laws, filled with all these types of, of laws telling them to care for the vulnerable, the logic was very clear. The logic was remember where you came from. You were slaves in Egypt. Remember that. Don't ever forget that. And so neighborliness wasn't an issue of charity or private preference, but to the people of God, it was an issue of justice. Compassion, care, concern, and movement towards our neighbor is woven all throughout Scripture. And so in response to the law expert's question, Jesus tells a story. And in Luke 1030, Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among robbers and they stripped him and they beat him and they went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, and the way I always read this is by chance, well, by sheer miracle, right? Like, like this day is horrible, but by, by a miracle, a priest is walking down the road. This day can't get any worse if I'm the guy on the road, but a priest is on his way. Man, this is all going to change. And he comes down that road and when he saw him, he Pass by on the other side. It's okay, though, because likewise, a Levite, I mean, lightning strikes twice in a day. A Levite comes. A Levite walks down the same street. 
When he came to that place and saw him, he too passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. If I'm that guy on the road, half dead, I got my eye half open, I see a Samaritan coming up, I'm thinking, oh man, if I wasn't dead before. But it says he saw him, he felt compassion. He came to him, he bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on him, and he put him on his own beast, he brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, whatever more you spend when I return, I'll repay you. Now, many readers of this parable spend a lot of time speculating why the priest and the Levite didn't stop to help this man. Uh, you know, if anyone should have done it, it should have been them, right? This is their brother in the faith, right? The, the Mosaic law, which they should have known, uh, talks a lot about how they should care for their neighbor. But what's interesting is Jesus doesn't even speak to this when he tells a story. He says nothing even about why they didn't stop. Maybe it's because he knows it's what most of us would do in the situation. I mean, think about it. You're on a road, a dangerous road, and you see someone hurting. Like many of us would make a business decision and just say, uh, I'm out. But then a Samaritan came along. Samaritans and Jews were the bitterest of enemies. Samaritans were seen by Jews as racial half-breeds and religious heretics. So there was a great animosity between them, yet when the Samaritan saw the man in the road, he was moved with compassion. And he did something. And so Jesus is answering this man's question of who is my neighbor by depicting a man meeting material, physical, and economic needs through deeds. He's saying that neighborly love means being sacrificially involved with the vulnerable. Here's the Savior's stance. By depicting a, a, a Samaritan helping a Jew, Jesus could not have found a more forceful way to say that anyone at all in need, regardless of race, regardless of politics, regardless of class, regardless of religion, that's your neighbor. So what's the spiritual significance of neighborliness? What's in it for me? What's in it for me? I think the reason why neighborliness is so difficult for many of us is because it's a direct assault uh, at the very things that are fundamentally wrong with us, right? We are selfish by nature, right? We are selfish by nature. Um, Christian uh, author and uh, counselor Lou Priolo calls selfishness the mother of all sins. Uh, it, it's, it's the sin that spawns them all, that, that it's from the love of self that all other inordinate loves flow. John Calvin said, we shall never love our neighbors with sincerity according to our Lord's intention until we have corrected love of ourselves. The two affections are opposite and contradictory. Because man is sinful, God's practical remedy for man is to learn how to love God and love his neighbor. Like these, these are the two greatest practical antidotes for indwelling sin. The more you love God, the more you love your neighbor the less selfish and sinful you'll be. So selfishness has this overarching issue that keeps us from neighborliness, but it spawns these other issues, these other reasons why we avoid neighborliness. It spawns things like fear. It spawns things like uh, judgmentalism. It spawns things like a faulty view of our own uh, lack and in, in, uh, sufficiency. And, and unless you address these things by loving your neighbor anyway, you'll never overcome them. You'll never overcome them. All right, looking at a few of these, you start with fear, right? I, I think it's safe to assume that the reason why the priest and the Levite passed this man on the road was because it was unsafe. Like many, uh, uh, many uh, robbers are, are down this road, yeah? And, and so maybe the robbers were still around. Maybe uh, this man was faking it and it was a trap and they were going to get ambushed, they thought. Surely it must have been on their minds to think safety first, Yeah. See, I think in our American lifestyle, we become obsessed with safety almost to the point of becoming overly risk averse, yeah. don't we? Uh, far too often, if I can just confess this, far too often, I think safety and then obedience to God. I just do. I do. 
But what would have happened if our biblical heroes thought safety first? I go, like, what would have happened? Moses would have never stepped to Pharaoh. Uh, David would have never stepped to Goliath. Paul, as Brandon referenced, Paul would have never written two-thirds of the New Testament, many of which were written from a jail cell. Jesus would have never stepped to the cross. I mean, think about this. Martin Luther King Jr., one of my heroes, Martin Luther King Jr., think about him. We we love the things that he said. We love the things that he he did. But can I just tell you guys, they slayed this brother in the streets. He walked around every day knowing full well his life was in danger fulfilling the, the for fulfilling the, the call of God on his life. Yet he, he deemed the call of God worthy of that risk. He did. Uh, Jim Elliott, uh, the dear um, missionary who was martyred bringing the gospel to an unreached group, he said, the safest place to be is at the center of God's will. So listen to me when I'm saying this. Our faith does not revolve around safety. Nor does it grow if safety is our only and ultimate concern. I'm not telling you to be a dummy. Please, don't go out here lying on me. But what I'm saying is, if, you're, if, if it's ultimate to you, if you size up an opportunity to do something for the Lord and for someone else, and you think to yourself, I can't get hurt, I can't, I can't. If you, if you think, like, you think me first, that's the challenge today. That's the challenge. That our faith must be rooted in obedience and sensitivity to God's leading. Amen? Amen. Look at judgment. Judgment. Uh, Maybe the priest and the Levite, uh, they saw the man in the road, and they thought that he got there by his own doing. Like, it's easy to speculate that the reason why people find themselves in dire need is at least in some way because of their own irresponsible actions. And so it's so easy to make sense in our mind why we should kind of let people hang out in their situation. It just is. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we we like to think of ourselves that way. Uh, But I think many of us are what what Tim Keller in his book, Generous Justice, called middle class in spirit. I'm telling you, many of us are middle class in spirit. Like maybe you feel like you, uh, you earned a certain standing with God through your hard work. Like, like your success and resources you have are primarily due to, to your own energy and industry. Now, although the Bible does agree with you, look at, in the book of Proverbs, you'll see this. The Bible does agree with you that your industriousness is an irreplaceable reason why you're successful. It's not the whole reason. If you were born on a mountaintop in Tibet in the 13th century instead of a Western country in the 20th century, It wouldn't matter how hard you worked. You wouldn't have a whole lot to show for it. And so, let me say that, and I love you, so please receive this from me. If you have money, if you have power, if you have status today, it is because of the century and the place that you were born, because of your health, your talent, and your capacity, none of which you earned. Don't throw rocks, please. (laughs) People who have have come to grasp the gospel of grace and have become spiritually poor find their hearts gravitating towards the materially poor. To the degree that the gospel shapes your self-image, you will identify with those in need. It becomes very hard to to judge us. You'll see people with tattered clothes and you'll think to yourself, man, all my righteousness is but filthy rags. It's only the only, nothing less than the death of the Son of God. Nothing less has saved me, and I'm clothed in his robes. Like you'll see someone who's economically poor, and you can't say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, because you certainly didn't do that spiritually. (laughs) Jesus intervened for you, right? And you can't say, I won't help you because you got yourself in this mess, because Jesus came down to earth, moved into your spiritually poor neighborhood, as it were, and he helped you even though all your own spiritual issues were your own fault. And so people who have grasped the gospel of grace understand that when they see a poor person, a vulnerable person, they're looking in a mirror. Their hearts must go out to them without an ounce of superiority or indifference. 
let's look at our own insufficiency. You guys doing all right? You all right? We're, we're friends, right? We're friends. Okay. Insufficiency. Perhaps the priest and the Levite uh, saw the man and they thought to themselves, I don't have anything to give. Like, I only brought enough for my own journey. I, 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 there's nothing I can really do. And plus, this, man, this brother needs to go to the hospital. Like, I can't, there's nothing I can really do. Maybe that's what they thought. Jonathan Edwards, in a sermon that he preached to his parishioners on charity to the poor in the 1700s, he sought to answer the issue of scarcity. And he made it clear that when you say, I can't help anyone, oh, man, this is so American. Help me, Lord. When you say, I can't help anyone, what you're actually saying is, I can't help anyone without burdening myself, cutting into how I live. All right. But that's exactly what biblical love requires. Right? And so he goes on to say in this message, he says, if we are never obliged to relieve our others' burdens, but only when we can do it without burdening ourselves, then how do we bear our neighbor's burdens when we bear no burden at all? Wow. There was a, a rancher in West Texas during the Depression by the name of Ira Yates. And Mr. Yates was like many other ranchers and farmers during his time. He had a lot of land and a lot of debt. And unable to make enough on his ranching operation to pay the principal and the interest on the mortgage, he was in danger of losing the ranch. With little money for clothes and food, his family had to live on government subsidy. But one day, an oil company came to the area and they told him that they believed that there was oil on his land. And they asked by his permission to drill a well, and he obliged. And upon digging, they struck a huge oil reserve. Eventually, they discovered that they had enough oil to fill tens of thousands of barrels full of oil daily. And Mr. Yates owned it all. You see, the day he purchased the land, he received the oil and mineral rights, yet he'd been living on relief. A billionaire living in poverty. The problem, he didn't know that the oil was there even though he owned it. I think we're like Mr. Yates. I think we are. As Christians, we are heirs to a vast treasure. Yet many of us live in spiritual poverty. We see needs of others around us and we hoard all of our own resources in fear that will run out when the truth of the matter is that we are spiritual billionaires. Man, man, I, I wonder what would happen if the church would just finally understand and start walking out this idea that we've been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. Like, like, I, like I wonder what would happen if the people of God just finally stood up and realized that we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ and we lived it out. I, like, I wonder what would happen if I started walking around and, and I just started believing and acting as if I was a prince in the kingdom of heaven that, that God calls me. Like, I don't want to live like I'm broke if I'm not. I don't know about you. I don't want to refuse to reach out to others because of a faulty understanding of who I really am. See, loving your neighbor has spiritual implications for us. It's the only thing that crowds out selfishness, fear, judgment, indifference. And so lastly, as we begin to wrap it up, Ben, come on back. I'm winding down. The law expert asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And through this one story, Jesus absolutely blitzed him with answers. He shows the man in this one story, my neighbor is hurting. My neighbor needs help. My neighbor are those who can't help themselves. My neighbor is someone who appears on my path. My neighbor is someone who's unable to ask for help. My neighbor is of a different race. My neighbor is a stranger. My neighbor is someone I'm afraid to help. My neighbor is someone who is dangerous to help. Uh, My neighbor looks horrible. My neighbor is of a different religion. My neighbor is a victim of injustice. My neighbor can't say thank you. My neighbor is someone nobody wants to help. My neighbor will cost me time. My neighbor will cost me money. My neighbor can't repay me. Jesus is trying to make a point. Your neighbor is anyone in need. Jesus ends this story with a question of his own. He says, who is the neighbor to the man on the road? And I want you to see this, that this law expert couldn't even say the word Samaritan. Couldn't even say it. 
He had to admit it, but he couldn't say it. So he had to say it was the one who showed mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. One of the interesting twists to this parable was the placement of the Jewish man in the story. I remember Jesus was telling the story to a Jewish man. But instead of placing a Samaritan in the road as a victim, he placed a Jew in the road. In other words, he was asking the man to imagine himself as a victim of violence, dying with no hope if the Samaritan didn't stop to help him. And so he's asking this man, how would you want the Samaritan to act if that was your situation? Like, wouldn't you want him to be a neighbor to you across all racial and religious barriers? What he was saying to this man is, what if your only hope was to get ministry from someone who not only didn't owe you any help, but actually owed you the exact opposite? What if your only hope was to get free grace from someone who had every justification based on his relationship to you to trample you? This law expert couldn't see what we can see because Jesus was standing right in front of him. But I want to tell you this today. We are like that man dying on the road. Spiritually, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, it says in the book of Ephesians. But when Jesus came into our dangerous world, he came down our road. And though we had been his enemies, he was moved with compassion by our plight. He came to us and saved us, not merely at the risk of his life, as in the case of the Samaritan, but at the cost of his life. On the cross, Jesus paid a debt we could have never paid ourselves. And for that, Jesus is the great Samaritan to whom the good Samaritan points. When we talk about the source of strength to do this well, before you can actually give out this neighbor love, you have to receive it, yeah? You have to receive it. This is a source of strength. Only when you see that you've been saved graciously by someone who owes you the opposite can you go out into the world looking to help absolutely everyone in need. And once we receive this ultimate radical neighbor love through Jesus, we can start to be the neighbors that God calls us to be. About a month ago, a uh, month and a half ago, we got a knock at our door very early in the morning, and it was our next-door neighbor. I, th- I think I told some of you guys this story already. It was our next-door neighbor really early in the morning. I opened the door, and he has my sopping wet wallet in his hand. He says, man, Sean, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but someone broke into your car last night, both of your cars. And uh, so I look outside, and I see my doors are flung all open. And what they had done, and just a really weird series of events, I never leave my wallet in the car except that night. I never leave our doors unlocked except that night. And the person that had broken in, they stole all the cash out of our cars. They stole all the cash out of my wallet. And they took my wallet and they spread it all across my neighbor's lawn and his sprinklers got it wet. And so I went out and I collected all my stuff. I put all of our stuff back and I walked into the house. Amy overheard the conversation. I walked back in the house and Amy and I, just locked eyes and we just had this moment where it was like what's understood doesn't even have to be said because of the reason why we even put cash in our cars is to give it away I don't even really carry cash but I have cash in my wallet sometimes so that I can give it away when I see people who need it And so what I want you guys to see is you can't even steal from me because I give my stuff away anyway. That's what we're called to as the people of God. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, I just thank you for the people of God. thank you, Lord, that I have the opportunity to represent you to the world around me. Lord, I know that it is a burden, and you know this too, Lord, it is a burden to carry 
other people's burdens sometimes. But I take confidence in the reality. I take confidence in the reality that you, Jesus, are the beast of burdens. And you came down and you died for me. You gave your life for me. You walked down that road and you saw me beat up half dead and you nursed my wounds. You nursed me to health and you restored me. And because you did that, Lord, my life is open. That that the blessed hope that I have in my heart is certainly worth dying for because you died first, Jesus. Teach us as a people of God to embody that, to incarnate that to the world around us. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Come on, give it up for Sean right now. Let's stand up together.